<coughs> All right. <clears throat> hey, Barry. Good morning. How are you feeling today? Uh, let's see. The main thing I think I can say about COVID is recovery is gradual and slow. It's, it, I can't say that it's been dire. I can't say it's been debilitating. It's just been minor stuff, but just longer than I'd like. Yeah. Well, you look much more lively today. I'm actually willing to show myself on video. Exactly. Yesterday, I wasn't even doing that. Yeah. Well, yesterday, I haven't done my hair. I haven't put on my dress yet. You know, <laughs> still dark out. I guess it would be, yeah, because um, yeah, it gets light here. Getting light. Barely getting light. Yeah. Uh, computer, when is sunrise? Sunrise in Kanina was at 7.53 a.m. today. Oh, 7.53. Yeah, so it's been light for about 10 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's the tip of the sun above the horizon. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, in anticipation of the fact that perhaps no one will join, I actually am uh, more willing to just dive in yeah. uh, with you and me. So By the way, yesterday I discovered that I could stop the video, or at least pause, I could actually pause the video, which is equivalent. I noticed stop you that. did that, yes. Yeah. I didn't know I, that I could do that before. So I don't know when you did it. All I know is when I checked just before noon, my time was just before the four hour mark, I noticed that it was paused. Yeah, I paused it basically after everybody else was gone. Um, I polled you to see if you responded, you didn't. And then I discovered that if I go to the upper left where the recording is showing, it gave me the, you know, the pause and, and it worked. So I just paused it, which is not the same as stopping it, but then I ended the, then I, I left the session, which yeah. left running, but with the recording pause. I didn't know that I could do that, or maybe it wasn't available before. I don't know which. Yeah, I don't recall either. Although when you do pause, as far as I can tell, if I remember correctly, it does stop a video and then once you resume, it starts another video. So it's a natural uh, break point. So you would end up getting a second yes. recording. Does it yes. continue the recording? It does yeah. not. Okay, but at least I know that I can pause the video, which is essentially equivalent to ending it. Yeah, it's 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 a good thing, right? Yeah. So let me go back to my collective notes here. It always starts with systems thinking, by the way. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so I think two or three weeks ago. I had mentioned this one statement that I wrote and I read, which I was hoping we could get delve into, but I think the conversation didn't go in that direction. Let me try again. The statement is as follows. The sophistication of mathematics, engineering, science, etc., is so far beyond the reach of most people that they think I don't need it while they enjoy the benefits of those developments. Now, unfortunately, the reason I find that worthy of discussion is this, I don't need it, has influence in, well, therefore, it doesn't need to be in the educational curriculum. Because people say, I don't need math, I don't need algebra, I don't need calculus, I don't need these and the other thing, which is so, dare I say stupid? It's so stupid. It's, it's um, sad. And so that, it's stupid. it's lamentable. It's lamentable. I do lament. I do yeah. lament. There is a hybrid solution. You know, I I have no faculty at doing art. I I can't draw. I can't play an instrument. I can't carry a tune. Um, you know, I I can't dance. Well, I can dance, but I mean, you wouldn't want to watch me. So the thing is, is that even though I have essentially nil faculty at producing. I can still appreciate music. I can appreciate art. Um, and so I think what we need is math and science appreciation courses where you're not expected to do science and math at anything beyond, say, I don't know, basic arithmetic, but you can appreciate it for its value and its beauty and its uh, significance without being able to produce it. And I would like to see 
science appreciation, math appreciation, technology appreciation, um, so that at least you know that it exists, you know how challenging it is or how easy it is or how difficult it is or how expensive it is, but you can celebrate it as something to be valued even though it's beyond your ability to, to craft. I couldn't agree more. In fact, when I was at Stanford, and I suspect when you were at Stanford, there was a course called Physics for Poets. Do you recall that? I don't recall the title, but it wouldn't surprise me. I, they should have had humanities for nerds. <laughs> because the problem is that if you go to the humanities, it's really, it's it's too much for somebody who's also trying to do tech stuff to, to get into it. So they, need, they need art appreciation and humanities for nerds so that you can at least have some familiarity with right. it, some appreciation for it without you know, being a, you know, a super expert in it. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing a programming class or dare I say even two programming classes, how much time do you have left to read, you know, Odysseus? Exactly. Or the Iliad, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So Faulkner. So I think there, and, and by the way, on YouTube, there's a lot of people who are pretty damn good at presenting educational videos for the layperson. Yes. Absolutely agree. I think YouTube has some of the best educational content I've come across. In yeah. fact, you know what I lament? I, I was laying in bed this morning lamenting, I don't have enough time to watch all the videos I want. I mean, there's a concise history, okay, <clears throat> that's presented by some guy named Bryson, I believe. And it's 13 hours. It's all of, uh, you know, recorded history in concise form. And it's uh, 13 hours. Which isn't too bad. I mean, you could watch that, you know, a half an hour a day for, what, uh, a month? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly done. what I want to be able to do. Like, you know, the, uh, the who's that biologist guy? Sapolsky. I want to just be able to say, oh, yeah. you know, watch one, one per week. Yeah. Man, after, you know, 13 weeks or, you know, 26 weeks, I'd be way smarter than I am today. Yeah. Those are actually recorded regular classroom lectures for a whole semester. Yes. I did watch them some years ago. When they became available on YouTube, I did watch the whole series. Hi, what Kayla. Is this? Hi. Hey, Kayla, <laughs> We're talking about uh, watching educational videos on YouTube that you would never have been able to, uh, say, take a, a regular course in college, but you can get um, a survey course of stuff that's sort of outside of your field, but you'd really like to at least be reasonably um, familiar with it. So the one we're just mentioning was Robert Sapolsky at Stanford who uh, videotaped all of his lectures on neuroscience and they're up on YouTube. And so it's every, so every, every class is like an hour or so. So there's, I don't know how many, few dozen hour long videos, but it's the, it's the actual course that he taught uh, recorded live. There's another and one that was- brilliant. It's some of the best stuff I've seen anywhere, literally, li literally anywhere. This guy can tell stories, can string ideas together, He's compelling. He's got a good sense of humor. He's got a dry delivery. He knows his stuff. Man, does he know his stuff. Yeah. So one of the most compelling episodes I found was the biological underpinnings of religiosity. That's actually the name, I believe, of one of his lectures. In other words, what are the biological factors that make a person pious and super religious? And By the way... Uh, Sapolsky also gave, um, I think it's called the Founders Day Lecture at Stanford. Every year they have something, it's either called Founders Day or something like it. And, and that is a very professionally prepared video of him giving the Founders Day Lecture. It's, I think it's maybe 40 minutes long. And that's one of the best uh, presentations. He's done a two or three uh, sort of in that genre, sort of for a general audience, but with enough content that, you know, you don't just get a very surface level so no. if you look for Sapolsky's um, Stanford Founders Day lectures or other, you know, special event lectures, yeah. they're wonderful. <clears throat> but, you know, there's another woman. Uh, you often bring her up. Her first name is Simone, S-I-M-O-N-E. And she gives oh. explanations of physics. S Sabina. 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 Ha Sabina. Hassenfender. Sabina yeah. Hassenfender is a German physicist who does um, weekly uh, videos on YouTube. And by the way, She's also, she also does song parodies that she writes and performs herself. She's got a damn good singing voice 
and musical talent and she can compose and sing and perform. So she's got as, as a sideline, a whole series of music videos that she's done over the last eight years. And that I haven't found. Yeah, the, I, I only stumbled upon them um, a week or two ago. And um, they're, you know, after my own heart because she'll take sort of emotional issues which are not, have nothing to do with physics and she'll just compose a, a song compose the music and the lyrics and perform it she she does one where she's dressed as doctor who that's kind of cute and uh yeah so even she does even costumery i won't say dancing she'll she she will do motion but it's not what what kayla would call real dancing but um <clears throat> but not just standing in front of a mic or anything like that so yes yeah, so sabina s-a-b-i-n-e sabina hassenfender she's also very good at debunking misconceptions and even professional physicists get sucked into these narrative misconceptions because the mathematics of physics is so arcane that when they try to explain the mathematics with poetic metaphors and hand wavy stuff they often do a disservice and you end up getting the wrong idea about what the math says and means she's always debunking the misconceptions of, of the narrative interpretation of the mathematics, the misleading interpretations. Yeah, and there's, yeah. a, there's a whole cottage industry of people who can stand and talk for hours about these, mis, uh, presenting these misconceptions and misleading people and even deluding themselves. <clears throat> yeah. It goes, think, it, it, go it goes back to a famous comment by Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And, and he was criticizing um, a, a concept and the spooky action at a distance becomes a headline. And then people completely misconstrue what he was saying and what he meant. And, and you get people who be, quote, believe in spooky action at a distance because they're given some weird hand wavy narrative that makes it sound like it actually is happening. It, it, it's a little bit like um, if I look outside the window and I see it's a bright sunny day, which it happens to be here. Um, I can infer that over in the town of Lexington, 10 miles away, it's also a bright sunny day. And nobody thinks there's anything weird about that. Most but, likely. Yeah. Now it's quite possible if I think about, well, maybe, you know, maybe in New Jersey, <laughs> it's not a bright sunny day, but I can, I can observe something locally and with high probability infer something that's true at a distance. A lot of people look at some experiments in physics and think that when I observe something that is the same as what you're, you know, what you're having, that I'm caught, that my observation is causing yours to become the same, which is nonsense. And there's a whole, whole cottage industry of confusion about um, doing a, um, an inf a local inference, a logical inference, and then saying that the inference causes the remote one to be, you know, to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. This, that's, <clears throat> that's the whole entanglement stuff that people love to make a big deal about. Yeah. Yeah. They throw around the word entanglement, just like they throw around the word quantum. Yeah. Oof, that hurts. It, it, it's really trash. She talks about that. Who? Yeah. Like, well, she clarifies what that is. I think Sabina yeah. does talk about those phenomena. Practically everybody talks about it. Some people who talk about it confound the confusion and some people clarify it. Um, and she's much better at clarifying. Um, but a lot of this stuff is so hard to interpret because you're trying to make narrative sense out of arcane hey, mathematical uh, expressions. What, is the, what does the mathematics actually say? And if you do poetic metaphors, which is what they often do in journalism, the poetic metaphors do a disservice more often than a service to say to interpreting what the math is saying. Yeah. Kayla, I was saying that uh, <clears throat> the, one of the reasons I came to this topic was this statement that, that today, sophistication of mathematics and engineering and science is so, rough, so far beyond the reach of most people that they think quote unquote, I don't need it. Right. Even while they enjoy the benefits of those developments. And the reason I get concerned is because people who think I don't need it turn around and say, you don't need it. My kids don't need it. Your kids don't need it. The educational curriculum doesn't need it. 
who needs algebra? Who needs calculus? Who needs, you know, uh, engineering? Who needs electricity and magnetism? Who needs all this stuff? And yet they don't understand the connection between their cell phone and all of these things they say we don't need. And it's so sad. Uh, Barry and I are, are, are lamenting frequently. Yeah. Lamenting and railing and ranting. <laughs> <laughs> ranting for sure. <laughs> ranting and railing and lamenting the, uh, the shortfall of understanding and appreciation of the lay public. Because we live in a very, very high-tech world, <laughs> increasingly sophisticated and complex high technology. And we need the lay public to appreciate the technology at a level deeper than the sort of surface level that they buy a device and they plug it in and it plays and you yeah. know, take it for granted. You really can't take these things for granted because there are people who spend their whole lives doing very, very challenging work to figure out the science, the underlying science and physics and the engineering to, to devise devices that then employ all of those subtle ideas and actually make them work at a relatively inexpensive cost. Yeah. That, that's really, I mean, that's really fabulous stuff and it's totally unsung. And many decades ago, when people say, oh, I don't need algebra, I don't need calculus, you know, I guess I would laugh. Now, I don't let it go anymore. I really don't. Yeah. And I guess I become one of these old codger, you know, uh, people with no sense of humor, you know. I guess I forget the, the common word for that. But I just can't let that stuff go anymore, you know, because they spread this misinformation about, yeah. yeah, we don't need calculus in school. We don't need algebra in school. We don't need geometry in school. We don't need manifolds in school. We don't need engineering. We don't need electricity and magnetism. We don't need all that. And it's like, that's what has created a society of people who cannot appreciate the sophistication of the mathematics and science and technology that serve them daily. Yes. That allow yes. them to spew forth these idiocies, these stupidities. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and then I see relatively young people who want to become YouTube presenters and they will parrot these explanations, which are incorrect. And so a lot of these would be YouTube uh, educators, you know, amateur educators, will pick up the narrative and re present the narrative, which is misleading. And yeah. most of the time, I say all the time, but much of the time, I will be moved to add a comment. In the YouTube, because on YouTube at least you can comment and point out the um, the misconceptions that are being presented, uh, and at least give a hint to the next level of, of of mathematics that they're overlooking that resolves the confusion. Right. Thank God my presentations are written for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, imagine, uh, Kayla, that you're you're doing a dance studio routine, and um, people are dancing in sync. You know, normally when you dance, you, if you have a chorus line, you want to be dancing in sync, sync, so everybody's doing the same move at the same time. Normally, that's not too much of a problem because the the beat of the music is heard by everybody in the room. There's one source of music, and everybody hears the music and they're dancing in sync to the music. But it, suppose instead of having a loudspeaker, you had a headphone on and you're playing a copy of the music on your local uh, you know, uh, iPod. Well, what happens now when two dancers move apart about 50 feet on a big stage and they're each playing back the same music, but they're not in sync anymore? Now that right. now they're dancing to the music that they hear locally, they're gonna be dancing out of sync and the audience will see they're not dancing in sync anymore. <laughs> That's a subtle thing that you have to worry about when two people are trying to do something in sync when they're far apart. Are they hearing the same beat of the same music at the same time? Or is there a phase delay? Is there a delay between when one is hearing the downbeat and the next person's hearing the downbeat? And a chorus line is exactly based on that question. Because how does somebody in the chorus line know when it's time to kick up their knee and their foot? It's when the person to the left does a kick, they wait a beat and then they kick up a beat and then the next one kicks up a beat and it goes down the line until the end and then it echoes back. So the signal 
goes down the chorus line. The last person does a kick and then it kicks back. So you do a half kick and then a full kick. And at the end, everybody's kicking in synchrony, but it doesn't begin, it begins at one end. And the notion that a chorus line where the person at this end cannot see the person at the far end, how do they all end up kicking in sync? It propagates down, it propagates back. And right, if right. you're in Radio City Music Hall and you see that, it's just, it just heart stopping. It's just astonishing how they all end up in sync. You, you want to say something, Kayla? No, no, I'm good. Thanks. I thought, I thought I interrupted you when you were going to speak. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things. There, there, there was a, um, there, there's a, there's a lot of, of logic puzzles that are based on that kind of idea, the chorus line <clears throat> concept. Because if you've never seen a chorus line, you ask yourself, how can two people far apart end up kicking in sync? And they can't even see each other. But if you have, if you if you can propagate it down or propagate it back, you can you can synchronize. So how does this solve in an orchestra, Barry? Uh, because you've got a conductor, <laughs> and everybody can see the conductor. If you take away the conductor, then typically the first violinist or one, you know, the principal uh, sort of sets the beat. But somebody has to set has to, has somebody has to be the metronome. If you don't have a metronome, you get out of sync. And this is a problem of trying to do music over Zoom. People have tried to have Zoom sessions like we are, and Sam would get his uh, instrument. What is it? A saxophone? I forget what you play. A violin. And, uh, and, and Kayla's got another instrument, a song flute, and you're trying to perform in sync. But there's a time delay between <laughs> the sessions or something like, I don't know, tenth of a second time delay or maybe more. And what happens is, is that the, the audience is hearing people playing, playing, you know, out of sync. And that was one of the reasons you, you really can't do music over the internet with, with the distributed uh, chorale. Unless you have somebody do a metronome or uh, essentially providing that function. You, you have, you have, basically what they do is they record them individually and then they synchronize, they, they, fix, they fix the time delay. So they, they mix them. Where, where the mixer isn't just the volume, it's also <laughs> the time delay so that they get them back in sync again. But you have to have, you have, to have a clock that ticks at the same rate. <laughs> this is how Les Paul would do it. Les Paul would record something on his guitar, and then he would play it back, and he would record the second voice in synchrony with the first voice that he's listening to, and then he would mix them all so that you would hear Les Paul playing a duet or a trio with himself, but he had to record each one separately, listening to the previous one to stay in sync. And when, when Les Paul did that back in, I think the fifties, that, that just blew everybody's socks off because nobody had ever used a tape recorder to do it, to construct a duet with yourself. Yeah. And, and, you know, he basically, you know, cobbled up the studio with that, with that functionality. Now, Sam, you could do that. You could record yourself playing the violin, then put on the headphones, play it back, and then play the second instrument, either a second violin or another instrument, and then you could overdub them. And if you start them on, in time, um, and, there's, and there's no drift in the playback time, playback <laughs> also is precision, then you can play a duet with yourself and re record a duet with yourself. Yeah, yeah hundreds, thousands. Probably millions of people do that now. A lot of people do, you know, one man band where where you're playing each part separately and then dub, you know, overlaying them, dubbing them into one composite. That's that's quite a tricky thing to do. And you know, if you if you watch Lindsay Sterling, you know, the, the dancer does violin, she will she does a few of them where she appears multiple times in the composite dancing or you know playing the music typically dancing and all but she's she is all of the she is all the go-go dancers <laughs> all of them and there's one that she does which is really clever because she so so here's here's one of the Lindsay's you know doing the go-go dance and here's the one next to her and at one point uh this Lindsay kicks and 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 kicks the leg of the one adjacent and the one adjacent reacts and that was not simultaneous because it, you know, had recorded one 
and he had to you had to pre-record one and then and then secondly record the reaction and then get them just so that it actually looked like she'd kicked the one next to her and it's it's never mentioned you have to be a keen observer to see how did this Lindsay kick that Lindsay <laughs> you know and they reacted so you know they will do these little easter eggs these cutesy little secret things that the average person would never appreciate um you you could do that way i mean imagine you could dance with yourself kayla you could record yourself dancing and then be your backup dancer <laughs> and composite them and you can even you know do a high five at the end with yourself if you if you, if you do it just right I think the way we got onto this topic was that rather than requiring everyone to go through the hard core of each of these, you know, mathematics, science, technology, engineering, etc., classes, at least there ought to be some kind of appreciation. Yeah. So I was mentioning to Barry that when I was at uh, Stanford, the course in physics for non-physics majors was called physics for poets. Literally, it was called physics for poets. Yeah. And it was for people who didn't have to go and do the hardcore uh, material down to the very last tooth and derivation. But at least it gives you enough so that whatever you're doing as a teacher, biologist, psychologist, humanities major, etc., you knew that uh, physics was important in society and life and how it connected and how it powers all these conventions and affordances that we leverage. And my, my rant is always that those with influence always end up saying, and I hear this way too often, I don't use algebra. We don't need algebra in school. I don't use calculus. We don't need calculus in school. Let's do something more useful. Like, you know, checking account balancing and stuff like that. And so they're constantly here. So not to put you on the spot, Kayla, but if you're around other parents and uh, PTAs, do you ever get any of that? Was that still going on or is that now alleviated or eliminated? Or Josh? Kayla's muted. Do you hear any of that, Barry? I heard the whole thing. I'm just wondering if Kayla is. No, I mean, not my rant. I'm just talking about in society, when you interact with people, do you hear that mindset? Well, I, for one thing, I don't interact with people that much anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I, yeah, you hear that, you hear that issue discussed. That, uh, I've heard that here at GCC. Uh, well, that's, that's sad. <laughs> That's sad, but I appreciate the fact that, you know, I can dive into technical stuff and lose people real fast. And um, I, I, you know, and I don't really know how to regulate, how deep should I dive into a technical rant Smaller before market. I realize it, before I realize that nobody's listening anymore. <laughs> yeah, don't go for many minutes. Go for 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and then you check. Yeah, and then you really have to prepare them. And, and this is where the poetry comes in because if you can find the right metaphor, which is a challenge, if you can find the right metaphor, you can get across the idea using a poetic metaphor. And I find that for a lot of the science and math, it is really difficult to come up with a metaphor that does justice to what you're trying to explain. Or, go at it the flip side find out what someone cares about yeah find yeah. out if you know you could expand their understanding of that phenomenon that field yeah yeah if they're so, interested so uh, I, i'm up against this all the time uh in the fix it shop trying to explain you know what malfunction in your appliance and and whether and how much they need how much the customer needs to know about what malfunctioned and you know and how to prevent it in the future or how to understand you know what went wrong and if you understand what can and does go wrong you can take preventive measures so that your so you that your products last longer 
that you don't wear them out or abuse them in ways that shorten their lifespan. So Kayla, thanks for the note. If I may repeat the question. The question was, in your interactions with other parents or PTAs or elsewhere, do you hear any of this opinion that, oh, I don't need algebra, I don't need calculus, I don't need engineering, I don't need mathematics, because I don't use it on a daily basis? You ever come across that perspective? Um, so can you repeat that again? Just because I want to answer you as accurately as possible because you are a little um, jumbled. Okay. All right, let me lean forward. Um, I'm always curious about the influence of people who say, I don't need algebra because I don't use it. I don't need calculus because I don't use it. I don't need mathematics because I don't use it. I don't need engineering. I don't need physics because I don't use it. Okay. And then influence schools by saying, why should we teach this stuff? Why do we teach physics? Why do we teach calculus? Why do we teach algebra? That I find is a dangerous influence on society. And yet I've seen decades of it happen. And so I, my kids are all grown up now, you know? So my youngest is 19. She hasn't been in younger uh, versions of school for quite a while. So I was curious whether now you've encountered any such parents with those kinds of opinions. Oh. Um, parents, not, no, not that I could think of. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose that's a good thing. But then there's the other side of it. Oh, we don't need uh, music classes. We don't need art classes. You know, you hear also in the arts that you, you cut out the arts or, you, you know, what are you going to cut out because you have enough funding? And some people say, well, cut out higher math or cut out music or cut out the arts. I heard that a long time ago from where I don't remember. But um, thankfully, parents these days, especially regarding the arts, do you understand how valuable that is? Um, as far as math is concerned, I mean, I, I'm going to be very honest. I say that sometimes. And it's not towards math in general. It's towards, you know, tailoring my children's interests in the future. And um, also living by example, just saying, you know, I chose careers that don't entail too much math or, or such and such, but I never like downright say, oh, this is bad. <laughs> you know, I never put it all down, but I just let them know, um, you know, in some instances in a person's career, you may not need geometry, you know, just say just that. And I know it's, it's probably not a good statement to, to state as it applies to a person's career. But I thankfully, I haven't heard that in, um, in my kids school or in any type of educational situation. As a matter of fact, they're, um, they're trying to emphasize more STEM related instances. Yeah. Where is that coming from? Why the is the emphasis? Um, because there isn't much interest, I think. I, I don't know if the education aims to diversify. Um, you know, because there's not too many people or um, not too many emphasis on science or interest in it, I think. This is just me really taking a stab in the dark because I haven't asked that question and it's a good question to ask. But um, I don't, in, in normal conversations, I don't see people interested in science. Um, I think it's just beyond them to even articulate science in their everyday life. So if you pick one of these people, What's their reaction when they see, let's say, one of the recent photos from the James Webb Space Telescope? Uh, recent photos from where? From the Webb Space Telescope, you know, the one that's looking clear out to the edge of the universe. <clears throat> um, very few people have, 
even seen that. <laughs> there, like, um, like for instance, this morning I actually posted something about the light year explanation um, from NASA. You know, what is a light year? Um, hey, no, sorry, one of the dogs took something. Um, so, and that was a repost from like one friend in a million. Um, you actually, Sam, are the only person who posts, or, and, and Barry too, who posts something about science and NASA and stuff. Otherwise, everybody, you know, does not. And um, oftentimes when I do repost something about science or NASA, um, only a handful of people are interested and think it's cool. Every, nobody else comments and then for some reason I lose followers. <laughs> But yeah, nobody talks about, unfortunately, none of my friends really talk about space or science or math, just maybe one of them. Yeah, it's lamentable. It's lamentable. Yeah. And the person who does talk about math, she's French. Hmm. Yeah. She's not from the United States. I, I have a sense of disappointment from you, Sam. I'm really sorry. No, I'm actually wondering whether or not I should follow up the question with asking about Damien and Maxwell, but I was wondering whether that would be too private. Um, go for it. <clears throat> do Damien and Maxwell have a difficult time or do they enjoy mathematics and science? They enjoy it. Love to hear that. It Maxwell is, is good at math. It's actually empowering. If you, any, well, anything that you master can be empowering. Uh, so it becomes a tool, becomes a usable tool. And so there is something empowering about mastering the elements of science and math and technology and engineering, just as there's something empowering about mastering music or dance or, or any of the arts, you know, sketching, whatever, you know. Uh, so, or, or writing, you know, writing novels, for example, or short stories, there's something very empowering about mastery. mastery. And you basically want to say, what's your aptitude? What, where can you excel? And then people will say, well, I want to spend my time developing mastery where I have good aptitude and I can excel and I'll sacrifice the others because I'll never get any good at it. And that's not an unrealistic thing to do about specialization because you do have to specialize in this culture. If you're jack of all trades, you're a master of none. You know, it's, a, it's so funny that you say that. Um, Maxwell's actually very surprised that I know how to play piano. <laughs> and um, it's funny because <laughs> when I was a, a kid, a lot of, I knew a lot of people who knew how to play piano. I don't know if that just has anything to do with the community I was exposed to, but um, there was more of a balance as far as arts is concerned. Um, even my dad used to emphasize math a lot and say, you need it for this and that. Um, and, you know, there's still a, still a correlation with everyday life and math, but um, unfortunately it's not as emphasized that I see um, in families today. You know what the word correlation means, and that's a concept in mathematics. Yes, generally. <clears throat> Am I saying it incorrectly? <laughs> no, no, it's just... I just, <laughs> well, is that your choice of words? <laughs> how many people can use the word correlation and actually appreciate what the word means and, and how to use it in an appropriate way that you know, isn't confusing or misleading? Because people can use words know. in a misleading way. <laughs> but it's part of the reason why I don't date. <laughs> Because nobody understands what I use words like correlation. <laughs> that is a requirement. 
<laughs> to at least generally understand what all of that means. <laughs> well, when you do your dance classes, you probably use the word coordinated because you want to be coordinated in your dance. That you want your limbs to be in some kind of a phase, synchronized phase relationship. You want this dancer to be in a, a correlated, you know, phase related relationship with the next dancer. You don't want to be uncoordinated and uncorrelated. Then you're just flailing. Oh yeah, we put those dancers in the back. <laughs> <laughs> you're out you're out of sync you're out of tune and you're out of sync <laughs> yes. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> there's a very funny send-up of a ballet where there's this one ballet dancer who's completely <laughs> late and uncorrelated and you know missteps and stumbling and it's a real funny send-up and of course the person who's doing that is actually the most expert person you know, to be able to dance out of sync with the with the uh, Swan Lake or whatever it was that they were doing the send up of. Yes. Um, and here's something that might be um, really interesting. People get offended. Well, my students get offended if they if I correct them. And I think that's probably another reason why um, people get embarrassed when it comes to math, math and science. Yeah. And they get very offended if you correct them. Just like what you said, Barry, there's a lot of misconceptions yeah. and you have to comment. Yeah. I don't know if that's on top. But. Yeah, this is another thing that all educators um, have to deal with is that at what point and how do you correct misconceptions in the uh, student body? And, as, and, and for me, when I got, well, at various stages of my career, what do you do when the teacher incorrectly states something either inadvertently or because they simply don't understand it, but often it's just, a, they misspeak. And at what point do you, do you correct the teacher so that the rest of the students don't get the wrong information? I have one answer to that, Barry. What's your answer? It's probably a two minute story. So I apologize in advance if it's long. But my son, when he was at elementary school, really did well in math, really super enjoyed math, was good in math, was getting A's, you know, all the way up to about fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So in sixth grade, he went to middle school. Our middle school is six, seven, and eight. So he got to this class and immediately started doing very badly. And so after a, a few weeks, I got concerned and I looked at some of his assignments and the teacher had been formatting fractions using a standard typewriter, not modern word processing, but like standard typewriter. This has probably been Xeroxed and Mimeoed for decades. And this teacher had been in this position for at least five or six years by then. So, you know, fractions like one over two had one and then an underbar and then on the next line had a two, but then where's the rest of the term? Well, the rest of the term was on the same line as the denominator or sometimes the denominator, but it wasn't with, you know, the middle of the fraction as to imply, you know, what was really going on. Yeah, and so, so I thought that was clearly a, an easy to misunderstand uh, formatting. So I sent the teacher an email saying, hey, I think this could easily be uh, misunderstood. My son misunderstood it. Can you please you know, accommodate that, hey, this is a possible interpretation. So to her credit, she sends me back an email and says, yes, you're right, let me correct it. So she actually corrected it. Two or three weeks later though, a similar problem happened. Another misformatting simply because she was not diligent enough to notice that uh, certain formatting of text could be misconstrued or at least doubly construed one way or another. And by that time I said, this isn't looking good. And it is exactly at that point yeah. that I then uh, started really looking seriously for a private school. And eventually Nick and Amy both went to a private uh, middle school and then eventually another uh, private high school to graduate from. But it was exactly that sequence of events. And this is in the Cupertino School District, which in the, is the, in the Bay Area, is one of the top, easily two or three school districts, school districts by reputation, you know. Um, 
I would have to say it, in this case, it was undeserved and probably over-deserved. But I, I had to speak up because unfortunately that killed my son's interest in math for the rest of middle school. I would say though, that uh, he finally recovered in college because he, even though he entered college as an art major, I think I told you some of the story in junior year, he finally said, Hey dad, you know, all my friends are getting internships, you know, either at law firms cause they're in business or at software companies cause they're in software or the labs because they're in, you know, biology or whatever. And he said, I don't know what to do with art. I can't get an internship in art. And that was a welcome conversation. That was one that I've been waiting for. Jeez, a long time. So anyway, at that point, I actually said, Nick, you know, I'll pay for another year. I'll let you go five years. If between now and then you'll concentrate on a STEM degree, STEM, you know, and at least make it a minor, you know, but to his credit, he eventually uh, made it a major. So he actually completed art and computer science as uh, two majors in five years at UC Santa Cruz. And so that's where it's got him right now, um, a software engineering job at Facebook. But had that conversation gone badly or, you know, had I not done something with his teacher in middle school, uh, I think he would have had a permanent uh, aversion mm -hmm. for math and science. Yep. And so that's my response. It's a lengthy response, but that's the one that's personal to me. Over. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's easy to turn people off to a particular learning curve. It's challenging to turn them on, easy to turn them off. But if you can successfully turn them on, they can have a fabulous learning curve in a discipline which can even become a hobby or an avocation or a career. Yep. I think I was kind of lucky because I was in seventh grade when Sputnik went up and that scared the bejesus out of the American education establishment. And they really ramped up, uh, you know, the science and math curriculum. And I rode that wave from the seventh grade all, all the way up to grad school. But I was very lucky just to be in the right place at the right time in the right culture um, where um, that that could lead to a good career. And that good career lasted 20 years until the government changed their mind about how important, you know, that kind of uh, ac academic work was. And they turned around and pulled the plug on it. So just FYI, I'm going to be going from this uh, location to the location across the street. I'm going to try and move a couple of pieces of furniture. So I'm going to be probably out of pocket for about 15, 20 minutes, just FYI. Okay. So I see Josh was connected. And Joshua, do you want to turn on your mic and camera and say hello? Maybe not. Stacy's not here today. <laughs> He's probably busy with his bee. <laughs> so, well, this is a well, this is a good time for an ask me anything or rant me anything, Kayla. Since right now it's just you and me, I guess. What, what would you like to talk about or ask about? Oh uh, well, um, I actually just want to get some stuff off my chest, just in case I have to bounce. <laughs> Um, today is actually a, so this is like my official check-in in the middle of this whole thing. Um, I have, I have a workshop today that's hosted by one of my good friends, um, who just left. He spent the night here. Um, and, uh, so I've got like a, what, one, two, three, four, like, uh, three, four hour workshop. Um, I'm hosting at about one thirty, and, um, last night, um, there was an issue with my dad. Uh, <clears throat> he started hallucinating and um, he was admitted to the hospital last night um, because he had some sort of a mini stroke. Oh. So I think we're going to try to, um, I'm, I'm going to try to have the kids see 
um, their grandpa in the hospital because they think it just would help boost morale. But I, I feel bad because I think this is going to be the first time they ever saw somebody, you know, in our family in the hospital. Mm. Um, and, you know, we're just a little concerned about my dad. I think it's a definitely a, I don't know, <laughs> but it's a, it's kind of a funny day today. How old is your dad? So, he's in his seventies. So he's Sorry to hear that, Kayla. That's no, okay. He's um, a lifetime smoker and drinker and a cancer survivor. So his body has been put through the ringer. Yeah. Um, and then we've kind of seen a bit of a decline this past year. But yeah. That's troubling, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> And then this past this past week, I've been in um, like domestic violence <laughs> webinars and stuff. It's been a heavy month, let me tell you. Um, you know, this month is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, so I've had a couple of trainings that were pretty heavy handed. Um, so much so where we've had to take breaks in between the trainings, mental, you know, breaks. Like after maybe 30 minutes of something heavy, it's kind of like, okay, we're going to take a mental break and check in with everyone and see if it's okay and take five minutes to cry or whatever you guys need to do. So it's been, it's been quite a funny, heavy month for me, but um, yeah, good times. Do you cover both physical violence and verbal violence? Verbal abuse? <clears throat> oh yeah, all kinds of abuse, verbal abuse physical abuse, financial abuse, um, yeah. you know, and then, psychological abuse. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it was really interesting too, because I brought that to the attention of one of my friends um, because she's considering separating from her husband. I think it's actually going to be a, a, a done deal. And I'm always very mindful and careful, you know, and when I spoke to her just recently, I said, I'm not really a good person to talk to you about this because you know as a single person I actually like my life and um you know I'm at peace and um I I encourage that I encourage peace I encourage independence and um it's too bad that um you guys are struggling but I had to point out the financial abuse to her and I always feel very Ooh, about that because her um, husband did not want her to pursue a career. He did not want her to finish school. He did not want her to, you know, it was almost like a, a control of finances. And it just really made me wonder, like, why? Why wouldn't your part, why wouldn't you want your partner to better herself? Why would you want your income to increase, you know? And um, I know I'm only hearing one side of the story, but from what she tells me, she was trying to help, you know, his depression and whatever he's going through, but he doesn't want to explore those methods of self-care, like going to the gym or seeing a therapist or doing something together. <clears throat> so it's, that whole thing has been like really interesting to me, um, especially since I've been in these webinars about neuroscience and domestic violence and what happens to children when they witness domestic violence. It's a whole shit show, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> oh, so I just had to get that out. It's very complex dynamics, human interaction dynamics. So poorly understood and it's fodder for tons and tons of drama i mean a lot, awful lot of drama is basically reprising <clears throat> episodes from real life yeah anyways <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to talk about i was really i often am here to listen and i like contributing my part as a listener 
Um, I'm really happy that you guys had um, told me about Robert Sapolsky and Sabina. Um, what's your last name? Hassenfender. Hassenfender, okay. Um, so I will definitely take a look at that, especially if I can learn something from both of them. It'd be great. Yeah. And also just take a look at her music videos because uh, she's a remarkable performer, creative in terms of the content, the, the concept, the, the lyrics, the music, you know, um, <clears throat> the video production, you know, the production quality. It's really quite remarkable what she does. And I was watching her, her technical talks on physics for, I don't know, months before I even discovered that she was also doing music videos. Oh, yeah, good, good. Yeah, there's a handful, maybe a dozen really superstars on YouTube who have educational videos on all kinds of topics, including technical topics and other topics. And um, they've become YouTube stars. They're, I mean, and some of, some of them are actually making a living at it. Uh, they've, they've abandoned their other, you know, uh, income producing career in favor of doing videos on YouTube and earning a living doing that. Right. Which is kind of remarkable because it's a, you know, <clears throat> how many people you know, went to college to learn how to be a YouTube presenter and earn, earn a living being a YouTube presenter? Yeah. Like, who'd, have, who'd have thunk it? But, uh... What's on your mind? Well, let's see what's on my mind. Um, it's a good question because there's there's a lot of different things on my mind. I mean, the, the ones that I've been paying attention to most recently had to do with the fact that the Nobel Prizes came out a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry and economics tend to be the ones that I pay the most attention to because they usually are the most eye-opening ones about, you know, what people think is important in, in those somewhat arcane disciplines. By the way, there's no, no Nobel Prize in mathematics. <laughs> there, there is something <laughs> comparable to the Nobel Prize. It's called the Fields Medal, but it's not from the Nobel Committee. But the Nobel Prize in physics went to three guys who did some experiments in quantum mechanics, which is a really arcane subject. And that generated a whole flurry of discussion that this is why I brought up this whole thing about this misleading interpretations because that particular aspect of quantum mechanics is flush with misleading narratives about what the math is saying. And, and, and the thing that's interesting to me, way back in the 1960s, a, a, a young, relatively obscure um, theoretician at, at CERN, CERN is the European nuclear research uh, laboratory facility. Um, he was scribbling down some, some mathematics and he scribbled down a pr proof that there's nothing wrong with the proof provided you accept the assumptions, the framework and assumptions of the proof. And he came down with this, this prediction or this theorem uh, about what you should measure in some experiments in quantum mechanics and he published it in a journal that went defunct within a year. So this paper of his remained obscure and, and unread for about two decades. And then in, in the 1980s, um, another young uh, researcher in France decided, came, stumbled across this paper, decided to, do an ex, to be the first person to do an actual experiment to test this prediction. And so since then, every single experiment proved that the, this guy's prediction from the 1960s was, was wrong. It, it made incorrect predictions. And now the problem was, what does that mean? Because they couldn't find anything wrong with the math. This guy's math looked perfectly valid. His proof was perfectly valid. And yet the experiments disproved it, put, disproved the prediction. And so this generated this whole cottage industry of trying to explain uh, this discrepancy between this mathematical prediction and these actual experiments. And it turned out that the mathematics was based on a simplifying assumption 
that would, would have been true if Einstein had never come up with general relativity. This is a little hard to explain, but general relativity says that space-time is actually curved, that distances and time, distances are not um, a regular grid and time is not a regular timekeeping that they're distorted. And the presence of gravitational bodies distorts the flatness of space and the timekeeping. And this guy in the 1960s ignored that. And he made a prediction that would have been true if, if there was no effect of gravity or gravi gravitational bending of space and time. And so he actually, if he had done it with Einstein's more sophisticated mathematics, he would have made a different prediction. <laughs> but this went unappreciated for, I don't know, something like 60 years and they still still don't get it and, and i'm one of the few people who keeps trying to point out the correct interpretation of this discrepancy between experiments and this 1960s math i'm getting no place <laughs> i'm even getting no place with some of the people who are purport to be experts in the field so that's one thing that was just going on because of the nobel prizes um, the other thing that's going on, <laughs> you know, I, I volunteer in the fix it shop every Tuesday and people bring in their household appliances and need to be fixed. And because we also need paperwork for every item that comes in, we have to be logged in on the paperwork so that we can contact them when it's fixed or not fixed and so on. And the people who do the, the bookkeeping are not the technicians. So there's this one lady who works on Tuesday, my day. And the only reason she's working is that she was behind in her taxes. So she's working off her back taxes by being a clerk in this room. And she is absolutely divorced from the understanding any of the technology. All she cares about is logging in the items and calling the people up to tell them. And it doesn't matter to her what's written on the paper. So if the paper simply says, well, it doesn't work, that's not very useful information. If you're trying to fix it, you want to know the symptoms. So when the customer comes in, if I'm there, I'll talk to the customer for like 10 or 15 minutes to try to understand what the issue is. And this annoys the hell out of this clerical lady. Because <laughs> she just wants to get, she just wants to get, you know, get their name and phone number and you know the name of the item and and the fact that it doesn't work and be done with it. And and um, so she's always complaining, partially complaining about us technicians, especially me. And I can't uh, imagine why. No, just kidding. <laughs> and yeah. go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, any, so, so we have this interpersonal conflict, this incompatibility. And it's sort of like a bad marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it has a lot of the same elements of because you're in the same room together and you're trying to each do your own thing and you're, inter, you're basically inter, Fearing. So basically she's on the phone trying to call a customer to say your item is ready. And we're hammering and banging around with equipment and turning motors on and talking to each other. And so, you know, there's too much, you know, audible content that's interfering with each other. We can't talk when she's on the phone and, and, uh, um, and when she's on the phone, she can't, she can't explain to the customer the true story because she doesn't understand the true story. So we have this, you have this incompatibility and it's, it's at the point where um, you think one of us has to go. <laughs> <laughs> John, it's not me. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's funny and tragic at the same time because she's not gonna change. Mm. And if we're gonna do our, you know, if we're gonna be functional and do our job, we gotta be functional and do our job. And we have sort of this incompatible uh, mode of operation. And it, so it's the kind of thing you, you lie awake at night thinking, is there any way to fix this? You know, what, what can we do to sort of minimize this, this conflict? And so I've been wrestling with this kind of, you know, offline for a couple of months now. And, and it's not, I mean, I can tell the story, but you know, like, it's like, what are you going to do? I mean, it's just, it's, it's like the Republicans, the Democrats, they, just, they don't get along. <laughs> they have completely different mindsets and modes of operation. 
Um, so that was on my mind. Uh, what else? Um, I don't know. There's, there's lots of little things that you want to deal with that are not life and death, but they're annoying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they're unfixable. This gets back to people don't understand enough science and math. And you know, if you want to fix things, you got to bring them sort of up to the next level of uh, logic and analysis. But that's not going to happen. And so, basically, you're declaring yourself the subject matter expert, and they don't want to be, you know, um, relegated to, you know, you have to you have to do what Barry says because Barry knows what he's talking about. Well, I don't want to, you know. So, and I don't like that either. I I would rather have people figure things out for themselves and be convinced, not you know, not simply have to somehow accept that, that, that I know what I'm talking about. I, and when I don't know what I'm talking about, I need to, you know, make sure that I figure that out. So these are kind of meta issues that are always, they're always floating around kind of sort of just below the surface, you know, how to explain things successfully, how to, how to deal with misconceptions. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it's my hobby horse. <laughs> How to recognize yeah. conceptions and fix them. Yep, I hear you. And I don't really expect anybody to pipe up and say, oh, I've got the, uh, you know, the, uh, the silver bullet to fix it. I don't think there is a silver bullet to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just ways to cope. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing, you know. How, how how do you how do you laugh it off and not be bothered so much by it that it's disturbing and you lose sleep over it? Um, at, at some point, you basically got to say this is the dysfunctional world we live in. I mean, look at look at the number of dramas on television, sitcoms that are revolve around the dysfunctional family or the dysfunctional office or whatever. So people are turning these dysfunctionalities into into entertainment. Um, yeah. But, the fact that, that these are popular entertainments just shows you that these dysfunctionalities are ubiquitous in our culture. And if you're living in one of those dysfunctionalities, you know, you what do you do? Just turn on the Big Bang Theory or The Office or Parks and Recreation and just laugh with everybody else that's got the same surus, the same grief? I don't know. I mean, you really would like to fix them. <laughs> yeah. Rather than just make fun of them and turn them into entertainment. You know, my sister has been looking at these YouTubes and TikToks and all kinds of stuff um, about these people dying. <laughs> and um, I'm like, why, why are you watching that? Um, partially, it's a fascination with death, but she really enjoys the message that most people in hospices um, are saying. That a lot of their regrets and what they would do different in life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, the one thing she pointed out was, first of all, most of the people that um, the subjects that she watches are um, at peace. And the, the second thing or the first thing they regret is not trying, mm. you know, um, and uh, just making excuses for the things that they really wanted to do, because at the time there was a, an unwillingness to do them for whatever responsibilities they were beholden to. Yeah. And she said, they, are, they aren't afraid, you know, they were more afraid of failure and now they regret not trying. Yeah, which is worse, not trying and therefore not failing or trying and failing, <laughs> putting in a lot of time and effort and failing versus deciding in advance that this is probably gonna be a failure, why bother? That's a hard, I mean, that's a hard decision to make. And either way, there's regrets. There's regrets on both sides. And there's this notion about which side has the minimum regret. You know, choose the side with the where you predict the minimum regret. But you're but you're gonna have regrets no matter what. Right, right. You know. There's Josh. Yeah. Let's pause and see if Josh has something to say. I just had to unmute. Sorry. Um, I, I I don't know um, if I have any regrets or anything to add to the conversation. I was just listening to your story about uh, your work and just, just listening, really. <laughs> A rare on-camera moment. <laughs> 
Yeah. I'm trying to figure like that 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 weird time when you're on FaceTime and you're talking to someone and then their hands getting heavy and no one wants to hold the camera anymore and you want to go back to the audio conversation. Like I have that with my mom a lot where she's showing me things they're doing and I'm like, okay, cool. And then I see her struggling trying to hold the camera. Yeah. So yeah, when to go on the camera, when to go off the camera. But I came outside specifically just to check in and let you guys know I'm listening to the conversation. Get those little stands for them to set them upright on the table. They're That's what I've got right now. <laughs> they're not too expensive and yeah, I'm on my iPad. I actually brought the whole iPad downstairs. So it's uh, it's one of those pro iPad Pro. So it's like a laptop. It's pretty bulky. I was trying to decide, do I switch? And then I, I snuck outside the house without Aya seeing me, I hope. Let's see. I, I haven't heard her. So. No. Does yours have a built-in stand or, or did you get a stand for I it? Got what, I bought an otter case for it because I was living up in the mountains when I bought this iPad. And I knew that it would get banged around because the last iPad I had uh, got sap on it. And then a friend of mine just, you know, put it down on a tree trunk and uh, I couldn't get the sap off of it. <laughs> I was like, I better get a strong case this next time. So I had the, uh, the Apple one, the little cute, thin, foldable keyboard. So there's a product you get in the auto store called Bug Off that gets in the buggy gunk off of your bumpers and i wonder if that would work on the ipad the bug off uh solvent i tried it you did try it okay yeah yeah sap, sap is a weird creature yeah well i suppose it's 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 intended by nature not to dissolve in the rain or anything so <laughs> you know, it, it has to have the properties that it has you know. Yeah. Are you okay with that that work situation, Barry? Is that uh? Well, it. I mean, a couple of times I've thought about resigning, just because the thing is, the pleasure you get out of. I mean, it's a volunteer work; you're not getting paid. So the pleasure you get out of it is successfully fixing an appliance and making the customer happy that they got their broken appliance working again. And if the downside of it is you got to take all this verbal abuse from this clerical lady, you know, at some point, you know, it's not fun anymore. And at some, you know, there were occasions where I'm thinking, you know, one of us has to go. Or, or, or maybe get a separate space or somehow. Well, the problem is, is that you have this one room with all the tools and workbenches and all the stuff in it. And that's where the customer brings the item. And that's where they're checked in. And there's a, the paperwork and and the computer that you know that has the database in it and it's all in that one room so yeah. you know, and the and the telephone's in that room too so you have to call if the customers say your item is ready to be picked up or people call in and say you know can i make an appointment or, or or can you fix this particular item and and because she's not that knowledgeable about the technology she doesn't you know she doesn't necessarily provide the cust the would-be customer with timely reliable accurate information so then sometimes i can sort of overhear half the conversation and suggest that maybe i should offer to talk to the customer because i'm because she's going to have to ask us anyway whether we can fix an item and she doesn't know how to she doesn't necessarily know the correct nomenclature for naming the item or naming the function or so if you don't if you don't have the vocabulary you know how do you no, you know, you, you're going from the telephone to the technician and back and you, so much information gets lost in transit that you really want to just jump in and take the phone away from her and talk to the customer directly and then, which of course annoys her but what are you going to do i mean yeah you, know, you either you either want good efficient information exchange or you have this issue of the intermediary who doesn't really know what they're talking about so just change the job description where at some point in the conversation it gets transferred over. Yeah. I, 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 oh, the other thing I didn't, the one other thing I didn't mention, if something goes haywire, which it often does, 
she will automatically blame someone or something else. It's never her fault that something isn't working. It's, it's She's never. perfect. And 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 so then she'll, you know, she'll turn around and and, bl you know, blame somebody else, and that annoys the hell out of me. You know, because and if you try to correct her, like for example, um, person comes in, so she has to take the the paper that they have to fill out. She takes the paper that they have to fill out on the clipboard over to the little place where they're going to fill it out, and. Uh, and then maybe then in the meantime, she's on the, she goes back and to use the telephone or answer the phone. So now the customer is standing there with a piece of paper and, and uh, they got the item sitting there. So I'll go over to chat with them to sort of say, well, can you say a little bit more about what's wrong with it? And then she gets off the phone and then she yells at me because I'm interfering with her job. And I, and I said, you're the one who brought the, <laughs> the paper over in the first place. You know, how did it get there? I didn't put it there. So, you know, she's she's misconstruing. She can't remember what she did or didn't do. And um, so I point out, I said, um, you're the one who gave her the sheet of paper in the first place and then walked away. And then, she, you know, and then she digs in her heels and starts <laughs> getting verbally abusive. Uh, so, so what are you going to do? I mean, you know, you work through the logic and the clues like Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, that <laughs> that doesn't play well. <laughs> so I don't know. It's 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 one of those. It's it, it's it's a. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can I can fix an appliance, but I can't fix a person. <laughs> there you go. There's the, that's the truth right there. And and I and, and I know damn well that I can't fix people. And I don't even I mean I know I shouldn't even bother to try. That's that's a lost cause. Sometimes I don't know. I I have obviously a family and I have a mom and we <clears throat> disagree on many things and we agree on some a lot of actually more than we disagree on so on the times when we disagree she usually just says okay i'm done and i say well how about instead of you're done we're done with that conversation we move to a different one and it, yeah. it's it's a real skill that i had to learn and yeah. i'm still learning it but this, sometimes this you just switch the conversation to something you know you know you're going to annoy the crap out of each other so why go there yeah so uh, anyway, so I, I know not to harp on this too long is just that it's it's a it's a recurring lingering problem that sort of takes the joy uh, takes a lot of the joy out of the uh, volunteer work and um, and the other issue is that um, the guy that that was already um, doing volunteer work who recruited me to join him on Tuesdays a few years ago. Um, He's becoming increasingly debilitated and not not being able to come in. So he hasn't come in for the last, I think, six weeks now. And uh, the other people who sometimes come in don't always come in on Tuesday or they're they're off. So sometimes I'm the only person there all day. I mean, not all day, but all morning. So if I'm the only person there, I can't sort of let you know let one of the other people deal with her, who's maybe a little bit better at. Um, you know, kid glove treatment. So that was the other half is that sometimes I was the only person there for the entire session. And oh, and then one of the other guys who does come in, he's hard of hearing. So when you talk to him, you got to be up close and kind of facing him and, and talking loud so he can hear you. Well, this <laughs> clerical lady can't stand loud voices, <laughs> you know. Um, and so when I'm talking to uh, Tony, and Tony's talking, and Tony automatically talks loud because he is hard of hearing. People who are hard of hearing often do talk loud. So Tony and I are talking, and we're talking at an elevated uh, audio volume because that's just what happens when you're talking about somebody who's, who's, who's hard of hearing. So that compounds the problem with Lucille, you know, who, who even if she's not on the phone, um, she's just trying to, you know, look at, the, look at the sheet and write things down or just on the computer. Uh, you know, loud talking basically disrupts her. So she she can't she can't focus if there's something else going on in the environment around her. So we have these multiple issues that just basically make a bunch of incompatibilities. 
Maybe you can record it and put it on YouTube and then give her the extra money that she needs from the YouTube revenue. And it could be a hilarious <laughs> YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, I, I suspect that would get me <laughs> kicked out real fast. <laughs> well, if she agreed to it and she's getting the income from the YouTube. But... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't. Well, first of all, to be a cameraman and recording it, that's a full time. You know, when I go to these Toastmasters meetings and I've got to be running the cameras, I mean, I don't participate in the meeting because I'm running the cameras. <laughs> so how can I do fixed jobs and also <laughs> be recording at the same time? <clears throat> too many, you know, Secure. too many jobs and not enough Indians. <laughs> Sam, you're I'm just trying. Yeah. Does she happen to like the Sox or the Patriots or any other outside interest? I have no idea. Maybe there's a way to relate that way. Well, first of all, I don't pay attention to, to uh, uh, professional sports. And I don't know. And I don't doubt that she does either. Well, by the way, she has another friend who sometimes comes in either to work alongside her or even to help her. And they bicker all the time. So her, she bickers with her own best friend who comes in <clears throat> at the time. Maybe that's her mode when she's happy. Um, all I know is that she's, you know, she's a descendant of the Bickersons. So <laughs> and there are people, you know, that, that, you know, in the music man, you know, there's that opening song, you know, you bicker. <laughs> How does that song go? <laughs> you bicker and you argue. <laughs> So there are people. But do you love her? <laughs> love. <laughs> <laughs> the Bickersons. There was a there was a comic strip called The Bickersons about a married couple. So anyway, en enough ranting about <laughs> the volunteer work that's not as fun as it ought to be. There's, there's no shortage of unsolved problems to work on. The question is, what unsolved problem is it fruitful to work on? <laughs> that you actually make progress and get some satisfaction out of it and the problem gets solved. There's so many intractable problems or problems that, that if they are solvable, that are going to take a lot more time and energy than is realistic or skill that you know takes too long to gin up. Hmm. All right, time to change change the subject. Somebody pick another subject. <laughs> Well, the elections are coming up on Tuesday. A week from Tuesday, I think. Oh, I got another week? Okay. Tuesday's the 1st of November, and you you never have the... It's not the first Tuesday in November. It's the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. So I think it's going to be the... Is it the 8th? I think it's the 8th is the election day. <clears throat> I'm quite worried. Yeah, I, I think the Democrats could take a drubbing. A lot of people, a lot of the pollsters are predicting that the Democrats are going to take a drubbing and, and lose their majority. Uh, and then and then we're going to be back into real chaos again, not that we were ever out of chaos. I mean, at this point, is there anything Garland could do that would actually influence the midterms? I doubt it. And, and even if there was, he probably wouldn't do it because they have a policy against um, doing anything that will perturb um, the, the, the uh, attitudes of it going into the elections. Yeah, but and also case, sadly, yeah. didn't the January 6th committee subpoena Trump, but that's after the elections also? Well, first of all, it's for deposition. Um, there's two... When, when you subpoena somebody in a committee meeting, first there's a deposition that's done, you know, not, not 
in public. And then after the deposition, there's the option of having them testify in, you know, in front of the committee, which in this case would be in public. Um, and so the deposition part, you know, it's not gonna happen anyway until after the elections. And if the deposition is basically bullshitting and, and Fifth Amendment or nonsense, um, then, then what do they do? They're not going to. They're not going to bring him into a, a live interview where he's just going to, you know, do one of his rallies, just keep talking and. You know. My guess is that if he gives a deposition at all, it won't have any useful content in it. it might be entertaining, but it won't have any dispositive content in it, and they probably won't have him appear on camera in in a public session. Sam. So on a slightly, but mostly unrelated topic, I heard that the CEO of Fox News, at the time that the um, elections were being called steel by the maggot Red Hat team, she had already said, don't give these people an inch in an internal memorandum. She knew that that was a lie. And that's been come. That's been exposed now through the FOIA. Mm -hmm. So I just saw that reference just this morning. So in fact, this is because of the uh, Dominion, um, Dominion, the voting machine Boston. company. Yeah, yeah. And they said that because the senior management of Fox knew that this was a lie, they sought damages that equal the amount of the top thirteen execs at Fox News which is that large number that's been bandied about. So I thought that was an interesting uh, way to handle things. And according to what I saw, the judge actually thought that was, uh, that was okay. I, I lost the, th the thread of exactly what was done and what was sanctioned. Well, that's because I'm not understanding it very well either. Uh, I think Kayla wants to say something, but all I'm saying is I saw a reference to Suzanne. I think her last name is Cross, Suzanne Cross, the CEO of uh, Fox. Yeah. And that evidence shows that she knew all of these uh, election was stolen claims were lies. And yet oh. she allowed all of these articles and the you know, rants to go on Fox News. So she knew that she was broadcasting falsehoods Yes. She agreed, she agreed to um, enable Fox to broadcast. Yes. Yes. So, so now, what does that mean in terms of liability for Fox? That's the part that got interesting is that the claim, Dominion claims that they want the annual compensation of the top 13 execs at Fox because they all knew, according to Dominion. Dominion. Oh, because part of it was claiming that Dominion's voting machines were, were uh, hacked. That's right. Which they weren't. So now, so Dominion wants to sue Fox for allowing these falsehoods to propagate yes, yes. and re wreck their reputation. Okay, yes. I get that. Now. Yes, I get that. Now. So anyway, I thought this was interesting. I haven't studied it yet, but I just came across it just before the session today. Yeah. Well, wrecking rep reputation seems to be the, the the main modus operandi of the political system in this country now, and maybe around the world too. For all I, that matter, propaganda. Um, and it's become it's toxic. We've created a very toxic sociopolitical culture where where damaging people's reputations unfairly has become the the main ball game. What is reputation if there is no truth? Well, that's the whole point. Is that if a person is a decent person, they're ethical, they're upright, they're conscientious, and you damage their reputation to make them look like a clown when they're not, then. How is the public to know that this person is conscientious, reliable, upright, and ethical when they're being portrayed as a as a doofus? Yeah. This is like this guy Fetterman. He, he suffered a stroke, which impaired his cognitive function. He's recovering, and you know, are are they portraying him as as irreparably incapable of mental functioning, or or what? I mean. How, Wait, so I don't actually know the details of this. Did he actually suffer one during the debate? No, about, I think maybe five months ago or so, he had a stroke, uh, which impaired him. 
and then he went through a, a you know a recovery cycle and uh, he did have a stumble in a, in the debate he opened the debate instead of saying good evening he said good night in his opening sentence and so, people made fun of that that he you know that he had insufficient um, cognitive awareness that he misspoke and said good night instead of good evening for example and so the point is is that you know is he still cog so cognitively impaired that he ought not to be the governor? <clears throat> See, that, my problem with that is Republicans will strike back strongly with such tactics. And yet Dems don't strike back at Herschel Walker with anything commensurate with what Walker's done. You know, why is he still allowed to walk around and spew forth these lies? Yeah, they're, they're the Dems you know. are impotent. Yeah. They are completely powerless and they choose to be yes and they let stephen colbert be the one who, who shoots the uh, darts at herschel walker john stewart and colbert and john oliver are the most reputable journalists we have these days actually yes. where's rachel these days she she's only on monday night now she gave up the uh, five night a week stint and now it's a different show but she comes on on monday nights for her same same kind of in-depth uh, presentation and she's also got two podcasts she's got a new pot an old podcast called Bagman from a book and a new podcast um i can recall off the top of my head i don't recall what the new podcast is focusing on but but she really does a deep dive into stuff she does your research and does a deep dive. Lawrence um, Durrell, is that the guy? He also does a good job. O'Donnell. O'Donnell. Lawrence O'Donnell does a very opinionated presentation. He's kind it's of- based on facts. It's based on what's, you know- based on facts, but, but it's, in, it's, it's amplifying the, the negative interpretation of them. So he'll, he'll, take, he'll take the negative elements and make them the story, uh, but it, but it is based on on true information. Whereas Tucker Carlson will just do a negative story based on nothing. But in in some sense, they're kind of complementary because they they emphasize the negative interpretation, the negative spin. So anyway, I'm very concerned. Well, I mean, you know, the whole game of politics is toxic. And, and, and actually has been, I mean, yellow journalism goes all the way back to uh, Thomas Jefferson's days. Uh, you know, he was the target of yellow journalism. Scandal, I mean, look, I mean, scandal sells newspapers. And if you can, if a scandal is real, you can sell a lot of newspapers. If, if the scandal is sort of half, half baked, you can still, blow up the scandal and still sell newspapers. Sam? Kayla wants to say something and then I'll follow up. I'm so sorry. I was like texting my sister, the guy in the workshop. Anyway, um, I've been listening to you guys. Um, I was trying to figure out the right time to compose a topic, but um, Maybe now is not the time. Maybe today is not the day. I don't know. Um, yeah, just wanted to. Um, well, I am worried I won't be able to give you my complete time in the next five minutes, but um, I could go for it. <laughs> well, you can at least drop the topic in. And then if we don't discuss it in depth today, we'll at least have it on our mind to think about during the week. Well, it's just, um, I was just thinking about wealth and another way to look at wealth, not necessarily, not necessarily monet monetary wise. And it, I was thinking about this because I actually invested in stock this week. Um, it was the first time ever, so I'm a little worried and happy at the same time. Um, and then if you can see behind me, this is tapa and it is um, Polynesian tapa. And back in the day, that is how they measured wealth because the process of making this tapa is um, a long process. You have to get 
the mulberry tree, you have to pound it down, you have to let it sit for a while. Um, it takes a village basically to do this. So the people who had this had a lot of wealth because they had the time to be able to procure such a such an artifact. So this is just one of the, the tapa that I've been given. And you give tapa to other families, you know, um, if somebody has passed away and um, you want to show your appreciation, you give them all this tapa from your family. Um, celebrations, just, just a, a sign of wealth. Um, I actually have what I call the dead body in my um, garage because it is like a huge roll of tapa given to me that is unfortunately disintegrating. And it's the value of it is just, you know, like no other, it's huge. It, like if you roll it out, it will cover pretty much most of my garage. Um, and I was given it, which I was like, oh my gosh, what do I do with it? God, it's too bad that we don't have like any of these, you know, associated with monetary stuff. I, I can't sell it because it's not a thing that you do in the Polynesian culture. Um, but what I can do is give it away. And um, anyways, I just thought about that and how it may tie to wealth and value um, and just see if there could be another idea of measuring wealth and measuring a person's value and their work, you know? Because as they be say, a, money, huh? There must be an ethnic museum somewhere in Southern California that might be interested in it. That's the thing. I have to reach out to those museums um, to see. It, it would be like Polynesian cultural museums, you know, right. or any type of indigenous culture museums that would be really interested in it. Right. Um, both of these um, papas, this one is different from the one in my garage, hmm. but um, there doesn't seem to be too much of an appreciation for it in the museums here in Ventura County that I see. And I think it's because they're unfamiliar. Sam. Yeah. Do the markings on the tapa signify any historical memory <clears throat> or events? Um, I don't know. Uh, to be very honest, I don't know about this one. Sometimes it's just like the family sigil. Sometimes it talks about like something that happened in history that they like to record. Hmm. But um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know who to translate some of like this stuff for. This one's a Tongan and the other one I think is Tongan too, but it's. So if you were still living there, would that be displayed as it is right now or would it be on a flagpole or would it be rolled up or what would it be? How would it be treated and handled and respected and revered and appreciated? It would be displayed. It's quite heavy, so it wouldn't fit on a flagpole. Um, and it, it's fragile too, in some cases, um, especially it up like this. It would be huh? put on the backing and hung up on a wall like that? Yeah. Um, in some of the dance groups, they just, you know, one whole wall is a bunch of tapa. <laughs> you know, so and it's kind of nice school, to see. In your dance school, would that be a good place for it? It would be if I had a dance school, but I rent out the studios. And at this point, I'm actually merging with the dance school because I've been really busy. Um, you know, hopefully next year I'll step into a director position and um, I just don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. And then also my job and then also, um, you know, take care of my kid and my family. There's got to be, there's got to be a ton of culture. <clears throat> yeah. I was just thinking of the Bell Arts Center in Ventura. Do you, do you know those people? Yeah. I know those people. They, they, um, yeah. They got a pretty good, that, that one, they, they have that one room where they have the big meetings in a giant like hall yeah that might be interesting yeah that's a thought yeah I, I i remember the senator came there one time for a, a meeting a community meeting senator Diane really? 
What? Yeah. So I'm saying they, they have, yeah, they have, they, they have great, you know, community meetings and a lot of people that come to look at the art, you know, everything from just local people in the community to senators to, you know, real art appreciators. And I think maybe they would appreciate it. And it's a community center, so it can represent the different cultures. Yeah. Anyways, I was thinking about that because I was like, how do we like fuse the past? How do we learn from our past in a positive way to be able to, you know, kind of change the course of the future? Because clearly the capitalism is just hindering a lot of things, um, hindering a lot of lives. I mean, the homeless, homeless population here is just dramatically increased. Um, you know, I've, in Somis, it was relatively safe. There have been regular car break-ins in Somis, unfortunately. In Ventura, since it's a lot bigger, um, I keep my car inside the garage, but last night I had to tell my friend, like, block your car. <laughs> <laughs> don't leave it open because he's a Hawaiian and Tahitian so like he's kind of used to that that safety and that familiarity and and everything and I said your car won't like be vandalized but just lock it and it's it's concerning when you have to say that because there are vagrants who you know people I've met a homeless guy at the dog park um this week and um I was like wow People are living in their cars. Um, how do we value the human life? So anyways, that's been on my mind. I just put in a search on Google, Tonga Cultural Society of Southern California and quite a few hits came up, which you might wanna look at them. Polynesian Cultural Center, yeah, there's at least some interest in people who have, uh, KCET did a story on them, well, 10 years ago. Um, guy named Eric Brightwell wrote about it six years ago. I suspect Kayla's plugged into those communities. LA Times. No, has, no, this is good. Yeah, I, it's so just... I, I would say, you know, take a look at those half, first half a dozen hits and see if you can find a contact. If you can find even one contact who has, you know, some familiarity, they might be able to broker a connection to. Um, I'm saying goodbye. Thank you. I got to take care of the little one. Okay. Hi, Josh. Bye. Oh, this is so cool. Yeah. Certainly, if you if you can catch those stories that were written on KCET, Los Angeles Times, and this Brightwell chap, you might find the names of people that he interviewed and see if they're still active. Yeah, or we can make dresses out of it. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually gorgeous dresses. Well, it's I think it's heavy though, right? <laughs> these are this is these are fabrics, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's. Would it be cultural appropriation if somebody made a print of those patterns and made that into a fabric and then made a dress out of it? Um, it it's already happened. Oh. And um, very few people have done that because the, the look on it is, you know, it's only, it only looks good on brown people. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you see a blonde person with this, like, it's just weird, you know? Um, actually, I have seen blonde people with it, so I guess it's not. But yeah, people have already done that. It's just very, it's not as, you know, appealing yet. But there's no taboo against doing that based on what it means? There's like so much appropriation. I think they're just like, yeah, you can never replicate like the real one. Yeah. It's kind of like that idea of, um, I, was, I was sharing a very petty <laughs> struggle with somebody that um, takes class with me. <clears throat> and um, anyway, she kind of oversteps her boundaries because she doesn't really know the culture. Um, I'm not gonna publicize the context of this, but 
Um, a lot of people think that she's handling a situation very disrespectfully. And I understand that she's not familiar with the culture in general, but um, I'm like, oh, it's just good knowledge for me that um, <laughs> this is gonna sound so bad. I'm like, it just makes me feel better. I know I'm a better dancer than her or and a teacher. <laughs> to know and I think that's like the um you know the I don't know but I'm assuming this is probably kind of the road some Polynesians will take like yeah we we know we know our real stuff we know what's valuable to us we know how hard this is so you know appropriate away <laughs> but when once they make tens and millions of dollars on it yeah it's gonna be a huge battle but I don't know I don't see that coming up really soon. But anyways, it was more about how do we see wealth? Like this is, it's a good um, indicator of wealth. It really is the time and the care and like the community coming together, you know, and, and giving it away. Like I can't sell it. It just isn't in me. And I like that about like, <clears throat> some people are like, oh, you should sell it. You know how much you'd make? I'm like, yeah, you know how I'd get in trouble too. Yeah. So it just kind of goes to the whole back in the day trading and bartering and um, how would you propose that? So you've made this reference that it indicates and signifies wealth. I was curious if I may ask, for what purpose? Is it for social influence? Is it for family status? Is it for marrying you know, this or that person off to another family? <clears throat> Is that how it's used? All of that, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's cultural mm -hmm. art. So if you have it, even though it was given to you, then all of a sudden you get this respect and you get to then marry off Damien and Maxwell and they would have a certain stature because of the tapas? Yeah, to be very real, of course. I mean, like if I, um, even if I presented Tapa to, let's say, Damien's, um, in Damien's school, and he told me this, made me so happy, um, but he is in Long Beach. They have a Polynesian club in Long Beach. And like, let's say I gave them some Tapa and said here, which is likely too that I will give them some Tapa, but he's not a part of that club. I would gain immediate respect from the people who, um, from the kids of the families who are there. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, personally, like, oh, of course, it's going to make me feel good, but it's not what I, I aim for. Um, I aim to give just to give. And once again, tied to today's monetary stuff, like, you know, it's, it's good. It feels great to give. It, it feels good to receive. It feels good to really enhance the community. Like, how can we do that? in modern day society with billion people on the planet. <laughs> no, do you have to give it in its entirety or is it even thought of that you could actually say, hey, cut, take yours, cut half of it and give uh -huh. half of it to Damien, half of it to Maxwell, et cetera, et cetera. You yeah. can do that, it's divisible? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's cash and there's cachet. There's a certain cachet, which is a kind of wealth, but it's not cash wealth, it's cachet. Yeah. Symbolic. Yeah, it's uh, great. Symbolic, it's symbolic value. Because value isn't just money. Value is, you know, much broader spectrum than just means of exchange. Yes. It's the look you get when you're walking down the street, right? <laughs> <laughs> there also yes. might be art museums that, you know, have space for something. Doesn't doesn't have to be uh, you know, Polynesian art museum. It could be any art museum might might be interested in. Painting. That's what um, Josh was referencing, the Bell Arts Academy. Yeah. Although, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I just had a question. 
Oh no, the, the Bell Arts Academy is a space for, for all artists to showcase their work. And um, they rotate the art. Um, I don't know if it's weekly or monthly or something, um, but it's a, a cool space. It's hard to describe. It's almost kind of warehousey. Mm. Um, it is such a cool space. And um, every Friday, I think they have these art openings where you could just walk in and check out artists' work. And it's absolutely beautiful. You know, you just go through and, and just, oh, wow, this is wonderful. So, yeah. But you were saying, Sam? I was going to ask another question about the tapa. In other words, you said it takes a village to make one of these things. Suppose you learned how to make a tapa on your own and you spent many weeks making one on your own. Would it have the same mm -hmm. cachet or would it not have the same cachet? It would, absolutely. Really? They teach that in Tahiti. I know a woman who will teach you the basics of making tapa. You know, um, it's going to take a while to get like all of this on there because this is natural dyes and you have to paint it on there. And just to flatten out the tapa, you have to constantly work on it. So uh, that is part of the reason why they did the pa'oahiwi now in Tahiti. It's a dance and um, it's a part of the ori tahiti otea, the traditional otea. And we're scored by certain elements and the pa'oahiwi now is one of them. And originally it symbolized um, pounding the tapa and Got coming up and dancing, you know, in couples because when if, if I could paint a picture, just imagine kind of sitting down, um, no chairs or anything, cross legged, working on this tapa day and night, you're sweating, you're like tired and stuff, and somebody comes up with an instrument, a toere, and starts doing some beats, and a you know, one or two people jump up and they start to dance, you know, just to break the monotony of everything. That is part of the uh, pa'oa. So, you know, there's one woman, eventually, uh, when I pair up with this dance group and we have like a fundraiser and take everybody to Tahiti, <laughs> so I don't have to pay for everything, um, then I would love to add that into our, our cultural tour when, when we go next year and willing it, manifesting it. But yeah it would have the same type of value. But besides um, art museums, there are art schools and art departments in large universities, possibly one of the art schools or, or art departments might have space that they'd be interested in receiving it. Yeah, or even the university uh, museums. Yeah. Oh yeah, the universities. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, most big cities have, have a dedicated art school and most universities have an art department. I know UW's ethnic uh, music uh, group is actually very well known for decades. So I know UW has an appreciation for Asian uh, AAPI culture. Yeah. I mean, I would be oh. surprised if there isn't multiple sites in Southern California that would be interested in putting it on display um, either permanently or for, you know, for a season. And once it's hanging, once it's up and hanging, then photographs of it can be put on the web so that people outside of Southern California can see it and <coughs> express an interest in ha having, a, uh, having it for their installation. I'm assuming you can't photograph it in the it rolled up in the garage, so you haven't got. Oh it. yeah, but but once once it's hung, even if it's only hung for you know an art a temporary art installation, then photographs of it can go into a catalog on the on the internet. So I had a thought, and again, it's kind of coming back to the whole like how do you how do you value something. Right. Like, what if I brought a little bit of this tapa to, uh, this is hypothetical, this is not a situation I'm going to do. Like, if I wanted to talk to a politician or something or a city official um, and say, you know, I would like to gift you this tapa for your time to be able to discuss, you know, what's going on, you know, in the community and talk about ways to overcome certain things. 
would that be viewed as money? Is that bribery? Those are some of the things that I was thinking of when it came to wealth, you know, because monetary wise, you can't, you know, obviously bribe a politician, you know, how do, how would the, obviously if it's looking as currency back in the day, you know, it was a way to be able to talk to one another, you know, have these elaborate ceremonies, give them something for their time. Unfortunately with money, you can't do that. Yeah. I think I would stick with the journalist or an academic rather than a politician. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's like an extreme. But go ahead, Sam. Well, if you wanted to do that with a politician because they're influencing something in the community, I wouldn't give it to the individual. I would give it to the office. Yes. Or the actual, you know, city or town or, you know, entity yeah. the guy represents. The I wouldn't give it to him personally. Does does the county or the city have an office of cultural affairs? Yeah, that's sort of a, a a public place. And if they have an office of cultural affairs, they if they have room, then they might want to hang it on the wall uh, or some oh, kind of education, yeah. you know? culture or education or outreach. You know, anything but not the individual. The individual yeah. probably would not appreciate it. They yeah. would look like they appreciate it for the handshake and then probably would not think about it ever after. No. Exactly. Yeah, you, you want some organization or institution that has a long-term interest in cultural affairs or, uh, or cultural <clears throat> education. Yeah. And, and as part of the presentation, idea. make sure that they agree to hang it. <laughs> <laughs> some places public. I want it to be in the background of every YouTube you're on. That's, That's right. That's but right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All your TikToks in front of this. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, no, uh, nothing less than three million. Ima views. Imagine that a high school or a college is going to put on an annual play comparable to South Pacific. This could be the backdrop on the stage, you know, to a play like, you know, I'm just using South Pacific because it's the only actual. <laughs> title of a play that I know of, but you can imagine, you know, a school putting on a play and they need a backdrop for their stage. Right. That would only be for I like gotta wash that man right out of my hair. I gotta wash <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Isn't that one of the songs from South Pacific? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Nelly Forbush's song. Yeah. I don't know if if you ever saw the movie, Kayla, because that's that's like 1950s, I think, South Pacific. It was a big, big hit in the yeah. 1950s, post-World War II um, culture. Yeah. H.C. Opinza was the uh, was the love interest. He was the dark-skinned love interest. Mel Forbush was the white American nurse who fell in love with them. And so there's this uh, ethnic... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Tension. Yeah, because here, here's this <laughs> white American nurse infatuated with this Polynesian, you know, this dark-skinned man, and and that was the whole point of it. It was, it was about um, racism. It's really. Am I considered brown? Might I have a chance at wearing that dress myself? <laughs> <laughs> Sam identifies as they them. <laughs> No, I don't. <laughs> I identify as it. <laughs> that it. Okay. Those are yeah. my pronouns. I don't know. Do you guys agree with currency? I mean, what do you guys think? Is there anything else that we could do besides throw money at people? <laughs> well, I find that throwing money at people often doesn't do the job. I yeah. Mean, you throw money at somebody who's really got the skill and the talent and the know how and can produce, but a lot of times you throw money at something and you get nothing of value back in return because no, because you're throwing money at a problem that nobody knows how to solve. That's how we measure respect, unfortunately. Or somebody else has more money. Yeah, and it's it's awful. It's like all of these rich people are getting all of this, you know. Well, I mean, uh, Bezos, who owns Amazon, owns the Washington Post. Elon Musk owns Twitter. Um, Zuckerberg owns Facebook and Instagram. You have these three, three richest people or 
close to the three richest people in America owning the three big media outlets or three of the big media outlets, social media outlets. So, and then you got um, a Murdoch owns Fox. So you've got, you know, all these, now he's not American, he's Australian, but, but you've got these very wealthy people controlling these, you know, huge monopolies on, on uh, communication media. Which is, uh, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. You posted something about Elon going crazy. Yes. Well, yeah. I posted, uh, when, when, when the news came out that he bought Twitter, I posted a headline, Elon Musk flips the bird. Oh, okay. That was in reference to him. The bird was the symbol. Oh, duh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, a, on, it was a slightly off color headline. <laughs> was supposed to get a chuckle. And a few people got a chuckle out of it. I'm not sure if everybody quite got the story, but... Um, but you know, he, he refers to it as the bird. He refers to Twitter as the bird. So he flips the bird, which is, you know, to buy, you know, buy and sell, you know. <laughs> we should buy TikTok then. <laughs> uh, we'll have to I'll fund the Chinese. <laughs> oh yeah. So I think the time is ripe for a trustable social media platform. And if I were smart, I'd be able to build one. People don't like well, it. I think it's harder. It's <laughs> harder than it seems. It, it, it's hard to keep the uh, the riffraff out. I mean, this is the problem with anything. If everybody <clears throat> was ethical and and good citizens, great. But you've got people who who drift away from good citizenship, drift away from ethics, and then you need the guardrails. And the thing is, you can't you can't dispense with the guardrails because yeah. For whatever reasons, people will sort of, you know, fall afoul right. of ethical best practices. And the guardrails are far from censorship. That's the typical cry is, oh, you're censoring me. No, there's a big divide between censorship and good guardrails. Yeah, but, it, but it's, it's a debate on, you know, what guardrails are needed and how far off the center line do you... Okay, here's one guardrail. <clears throat> truth. Respect for truth. That's got to be the first guardrail. Yeah, which then gets down to who's who is the uh, judge? No, 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 no. Truth. No. How do you decide whether something is true or not? <clears throat> you have citations. You have prominence. You have uh, uh, critical reasoning. You have scholarly studies. You have all of that balanced by just loudness and brashness, and you know, no substantiation. It is not that difficult. It does require some work. Somebody does need to do the work, but I think that needs to hold sway. And the yeah. problem is right now, the people that do the work to expose what is true and what is not are actually uh, too quickly dismissed. Yeah. And I think they need some stature. But yeah, arbiters of truth have a difficult job. Uh, and even the people- But it's an important one. And it used to be called journalism. <laughs> yeah, that's true, but it's not anymore. It still is, except it doesn't exist. We need to resurrect it. Yeah. Well, and you always have had editorial opinion. I mean, even mid middle of the road, the news media still have editorial opinions. And, and there's editorial choice over what stories to cover and what headlines to make prominent and what to put on the back page. Which is why the CEO of Fox is culpable. Yeah. And she ought to be accountable. No, Fox is still yeah, right. And Tucker Carlson should not be allowed near a microphone ever again. If there was justice. Well, that's and this guy, point. Alex Jones, let's see how much of that, you know, $1.9 billion he actually gets to pay. Well, he owns the the company i guess that has the investment so they'll go after that but i don't know that's going to take years i i probably won't live to see that one result there's a lot of people who shouldn't have the microphone yep in, in fact i learned about micro um micro presentations and getting to the point <laughs> and how rambling is not good <laughs> but yep. anyway 
Um, I'm so sorry. I have to go. Uh, Got to get ready for this workshop, feed my kids, check on my dad, and then maybe take care of my dog. He looks so pissed off at me. <laughs> like laying there going, Ugh, you suck. <laughs> languishing. Your dog is languishing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you guys for everything. Well, and same for me. I appreciate you participating today, Kayla. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Thanks. See you here. <laughs> Talk to you guys Eric, later. I'm going to go take a shower myself. All right, so we're done. All right. Ciao. Thanks, Barry. See you next week. Next week.